for change, to unmask the truth, to unmask the rot in our communities. Unmasking the truth will focus on the effects of corruption on women, prefer solution and demand for accountability. Unmasking the truth will be on this radio station every first Monday by 5.30 p.m. And we ask you to join us to condemn corruption, to demand for accountability, and to work together for a better Nigeria. Unmasking the Truth is an initiative of St. Ives Communications in partnership with Voice of Women and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. At least one in four women in Nigeria has experienced sexual and gender-based violence in her lifetime. SGB survivors suffer more due to delays in our judicial processes, sometimes due to injustice in the hands of corrupt judicial officials who take on due advantage of survivors, especially those at the grassroots. And in cases where the perpetrators are influential or wealthy people, they bargain with the corrupt judicial officials and justice is compromised. Hmm. Leaving the poor woman helpless. A lot of rural women end up not pursuing the cases any further because they don't even want, some of them don't even bother reporting. And for those who do, when cases like this arise, due to fear and victimization, they drop the cases. I'm asking the truth on your radio station today. We'll discuss how corrupt judicial officials frustrate survivors of gender-based violence at the grassroots level from accessing justice and how women at the grassroots are affected by this injustice. My name is Esther Alaribi. Unmasking the Truth is an initiative of St. Ives Communication in partnership with the Voice of Women and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. We spoke to women who told us how corrupt judicial officials have hindered them from speaking up against abuse and the violence they face in their homes and their communities. This is what the women have to say. I have a friend that was almost raped. She reported to her mom, but her mom didn't take it serious because he's a family friend and the girl was destabilized. You give me one time like that, but then rape one of my friends. Now, see, we go report to the police station. As we reach there, the employer will say, make we pay money to enter our statement inside. The employer will say, make we pay up to 10,000 naira. We still go another police station. Nobody, all of the officers tell us, say, even if they call the man, say, they sent to us if we no make case, but if we won't drag them, our life is being involved. Now, so we take shot of Benny, Otishele, Ben Rini and Dubuwa. No, 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 the hard women at the grassroots level faced with the, incor- uh, with the corruptible judicial system and the officials is devastating. Listening to these women in different languages, it means it cuts across. It affects women generally. The things that they've had to face reporting cases of sexual and gender-based violence or trying to stand up for another person. My guest today is going to shed light on how to address this menace. My guest today, I'm speaking to Dorothy Njemanzi, founder Dorothy Njemanzi Foundation. How are you doing today, Dorothy? I'm good. I'm very, very good. Thank you for having me on today. Yes, thank you for joining us today. All right. Yes, starting off the conversation, um, let's talk about the obstacles that grassroots women face in the judicial system when it comes to accessing justice on SGBV and how has this also um, affected survivors from speaking up? Okay. Um, I'll say that the biggest problem is the fact that there's a lot of exploitation of the poverty level of those who are at the rural level, you know, at the grassroots level, most times, because many people there are dependent, are largely dependent on their abusers, mm. and then many of them, um, I want to say, largely dependent on their abusers. I'm talking from a, 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 an economic standpoint, you know, mm. a financial standpoint, and because they're dependent on their abusers, so the question is, if something happens, are they? Uh, uh, um, are you just going to be willing to hear something like this? I'm sorry, I beg, give me money, make I go report to this police because I'm putting you in me, or give me money, I want to go to the hospital. 
you know, this is some for some uh, in some cases with people who expect even up to sanitary pads if they from the abusers if they have good behavior, you know, depending on the judgment of the abusers. And I'm I'm talking about the abusers from the standpoint of the fact that we're we're considering those who are facing abuse, mm. right? So I've talked about the fact that poverty is a major inhibiting factor. And then aside poverty, um, the fact that people do not know legal provisions and procedures is a very big problem. Because if so many people even knew that they had the opportunity to speak up or it was their right to speak up, they won't keep managing a lot of situations they do manage. They would just speak up already. They would reach out. If people knew that they didn't need to be the ones bringing the money for several things, hmm. they would just pick up already, you know. And so that, that's a very big problem that we've noticed. Um, a lot of people do not know legal provisions and legal procedures, and it has really inhibited, you know, access. And how does this? How does this become a problem? When they reach out, if they do, the first thing they are told is, "Ah." Uh-uh. You, you came with a broken head. What do you do to avoid me to break your head like mm, this? Mm. The issue is not what you do to make your head break like this. The issue is that there's a violence against persons prohibition act that prohibits anybody from even threatening to break your head, let alone actually breaking your head. Mm-hmm. And so upon citing that, they should actually take action. As if you do, you know, as if we, we knew that this, this was going to come up, Last week here in Abuja, there was a situation of um, you know, there was a situation of uh, a woman okay. who was beaten up by her land her landlord uh, you know, the landlord or landlady something of the sort, and the lad, the person in addition to beating mm-hmm. set a dog on the woman. Hmm. Now the woman went to go and report to police. Having gone to police station, mm. police sent one person, one officer. Of course, sending one officer would be because of the woman's status, right? Mm. If it were certain people, they would send a team of officers mm. to respond. I'm now pointing out the disparity in uh, uh, service provision. Mm. The service provision because of social uh, status. Social status. Mm. Okay. Now, one police officer was sent, and the land, landlady contacted the person went and released the dog. Hmm. And since today, the police has not gone back to the place. The woman is begging that we help to, you know, um, help to get out justice, justice, whatever justice means to her. But what, what made me bring that out is the fact that it's that in that land, even if it was a band of dogs, you know, if it was a... a, 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 a a a, a a person complaining that had better uh, a higher status or perception of higher status, let me not say higher status, perception of higher status by the law enforcement officer, those dogs would not be a limiting factor. Something would, you know, it, the, the dogs and the human beings be brought to book. Right? Mm. So I'm just using this to point out the physical barriers and mm. everything. Now, the law enforcement officers are duty bound to take action to help the woman. I would have expected that by at least today, the law enforcement should have gone to a closer court or something to procure some kind of permit to take down the dog, since the dogs are being used to, um, uh, what is it, uh, break down law and order. Mm. You know, but that's not going to happen because it's a poor woman. What is the cost of accessing police in many places in Nigeria? The cost of accessing police in many places in Nigeria, you have to pay for inquiry fee. Mm. You know, or the, yes, before it. When, when, you, when you pay for inquiry fee, they hear you. They tell you how much you pay for file. They tell you how much you pay to invite people. Um, in the last one week, you know, I mean, I work with the Dorothy and Javanta Foundation. Mm. We had people who said um, their children were raped. And when they found out that the children were raped, they had gone to police stations 
in between just investigating a police report mm. and getting police to come and effect an arrest, mm. 7,000 naira had been spent. You can imagine. And I'm talking about a of two minors. Hmm. In Nigeria, minors do not earn a salary. Minors do not have a means of livelihood. True. So I will never, ever, ever understand why there's any form of payment whatsoever linked to minors. All right. Except Thank you, Dorothy. The fact that dynamics do not favor a lot of women because women are more lean, you know, more, more tutored to depending on their abusers. Hmm. So when you, when you have police expecting money for file payments, and then if you need uh, medical, the poli- you are also expected to pay for your medical by yourself. By yourself. Hmm. How do minors pay for those? How then do people at graduate level afford this? And okay. I'm talking when I say graduate level here, I'm talking about those in the villages. Hmm, okay. So when you bring the capital bill, the cost of uh, high cost of justice, assessing justice in Nigeria, just to scare the basic people away from justice. Hmm. All right, Dorothy, let's hear from more women. Hmm. Yes, so you've heard it from Dorothy, and you can tell that this is a big problem that we need to address. Unmasking the Truth looks at the effect of corruption from the gender lens. Let's go back to the streets and get more comments from women on their experiences on violence. There was this young girl that trusts me so much that she came to report her father's molestation to me because the father is well known in the community. I told her, are you confident when you go to police station? Can you report? Say yes. So I took her to the police station. As they hear the name of the man, they say, we can't handle this case. We have to pay money. I remember the NGO. So I took her to the place. The girl is happy now. Pastor, everybody knows, say, he in the always sleep with small, small children. He go, they say he won't pray for them. He won't lie. I go report out for police. Thank God, say, inside that police. He get one place where women, they talk matter where they worry them. Now, what do you have to do? Hmm. Dorothy, you can hear what the last, um, you heard what the last woman said. She said she was sexually abused and she went to report, but nothing was done about this. And because of this, the trauma has disturbed her so much that she finds it difficult to sleep. So you see that there is a whole lot that we need to talk about in this. Now, how can survivors at the grassroots level actually access fair justice, regardless of their financial status? And how do we also build the capacity of these women to fight back in the right way? Well, the best thing that can be done is what civil society do, is what women radio is doing, and that is continue to educate people on their rights. When people know their rights, then they know what to push for. When their legal framework is in place, then it gives more people impetus to take action. Um, so just continue and, uh, 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 engaging and engaging. And in this moment, I'll give you another typical example of a case that we have at hand right now. Mm. Um, we had a lady who felt sick, but she didn't have money to treat herself. And at the end of the day, she ended up in Abuja, in you know the Jabi Lake area of Abuja. Okay. And she had been there for the past eight months. But while she had been there, people made it a point of duty to come around and rape her. And she said she's not the only one, that every female who stays around that place knows that these things happen. In fact, when they pushed into vehicles and, you know, they, they, uh, they, they come and they try to uh, have conversation with you, mm. they push you into the, the, the vehicle. When they're done with you, they push you out. Till mm. they still have stuff. They stole her, her slippers and her water bottle. Hmm. It's as bad as that. But in this moment, this lady kept on saying that because she didn't know where to access help, hmm. she was finally brought to DMS for shelter, but she could barely stand or anything. And since we put her in the hospital up till now, we spent over a million naira trying to get her to, you know, treated because of the different things that she has had mm-hmm. while she was there. Now, access to basic health care, what percent of consolidated revenue from is supposed to be, you know, um, to get towards emergency services? I'll keep on saying it. The government needs to implement this. Sexual and gender-based violence is an emergency. The government needs to be responsible in providing basic emergency care services. I know that there are sexual assault referral centers. I know that there are one-stop centers in so many places. But they don't cover the services that all survivors need. And the distance to access those places, survivors do not have 
So if we know if we need to support survivors, we must support survivors politically. There should be a survivor trust fund. And I've just spoken about a victim of sexual and gender based violence, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to note that our staff, our colleagues who have been exposed to this person are in critical conditions right now, critical medical conditions, because they are contracting you know diseases. So when we haven't even taken care of the human beings that reach out to us. It, there is no structure in place to support those of us that support these human beings who reach out to us to get justice. Remember that we have not gotten to a system where we deploy robots. Hmm. So the entire justice system is totally faulty. And if this person gets well, then it means that we would have increased conversations around safety of females in public places in Nigeria. But when it is not happening, it means, you know, perpetrators are thriving on the fact that there's no accountability system in place. What is the, the system of punishing, you know, police officers mm. who do not take matters in their appropriate places? We still have a lot of false settlements. We also still have right now something which I find very worrisome, okay. you know. The system that NAPTIP operates, for mm. instance, if you get to the place, you have to write a petition to them, amongst other things. Mm. Now, everybody is not able to write. Right. So, who is expecting that it's helping them to write? Can't they have a system in place where they record you and, you know, probably transcribe the recording, amongst other things? Because mm. I'm looking at the power of agency of the person that is reporting, owning the narrative, you know, the person that's reporting. And then one thing that pained me very much, very, very, very much, I think at the beginning of this year, was the far or at the end of last year, was the fact that there was, a, you know, a sexual violation reported by a minor against somebody who was sexually abusing her of the same gender. In that instance, police was accusing this person of lesbianism. And it was unfair to me. The police was threatening the minor of arrest. Hmm. It still speaks to the quality of the services that the police render, the quality of services that law enforcement renders. Majority of the cases reported for justice are stopped in law enforcement offices, hmm. in the legal department and investigation department of law enforcement offices. And then when they get to court, they will try to you with it and say, uh, you, you want justice, can you afford to pay a lawyer? Hmm. You are not supposed to afford to pay a lawyer. The police is supposed to give you a lawyer. The office of the public defender is supposed to give you a lawyer. Legal aid counsel exists because you are supposed to be able to access lawyers. And then when it's time for cases that threaten the lives of women and they need divorce, mm. law enforcement officers take their hands off these cases and advise the women to go and look for private lawyers mm. that can help them to protect divorce because government is not instituted to scatter marriages except law courts that you know have the power to dissolve marriages. That's very wrong. When the singer of Timachi died, everybody said she should have left to leave. Mm. How do you leave to leave when you have such systems in place that are discriminatory against people who divorces or separation, legal separations, can save their lives? Mm. All right, know, Dorothy. So mm. or we need to um, sensitize people on legal provisions and procedures to All tell right. them that there are legal frameworks that protect them and there are places that they can go, go to. and we need to have to in place that offer services for free. All right. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Hmm. I'm asking the truth on your radio station. It is an initiative of St. Ives Communications in partnership with Voice of Women and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. It is important that we hear more voices so that, yes, you can get clearly the picture Dorothy is trying, trying to paint and what the realities of these women are like. Some boys in the environment, about three to four of them, they gang up together and they wanted to sexually assault me. The boy's father is the bale of the environment. My father got angry and took me to the police station. When we reported the case, the policeman said they are going to do something about it. When we continued going, the policeman now said, no, it's serious, they can't know about it because the boy is the son of the bale. We should just find a way to settle things amongst ourselves. And now they didn't come to see me, to fear John Sumi, the Babel man, Fipa Dani and Joshepo. The major was seen or Dario or Lopa. I feel not see a lot of money. Kiwa Mura. I have been battling so well. 
Yes, Dorothy, just to um, make the picture, the picture that you painted about um, law enforcement agencies and some security operatives, some of these cases staying in their office and not being escalated. So how do we sanitize our justice system of corrupt judicial officials and also law enforcement agents as well? Well, I think the best thing is to provide platforms that people who feel cheated by law enforcement, you know, can, can speak up. I'm very worried about the different um, attempts to gag the users of social media because social media has been used largely to bring up a lot of cases to the fore. Mm. I'm also worried that in the bid to bring up a lot of cases to the fore, a lot of people end up committing crimes. For instance, sharing a lot of inappropriateness around children, mm. you know, sharing their identities amongst other things. These are things that, you know... Um, well, I, I admit that using the social media draw attention to them, but it would be better if they are able to censor the identities of children. And it, it boils down to advocacy, 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 spreading the word. We need to spread the word to all policy influencers, including community leaders amongst everybody. I mean, if it's everything a community does not accept, does not stand. You doubt me, think about the Naira Riverside situation. Think about the hoarding of Naira Lake and how communities have cried out and a lot of people are behaving themselves, you know, uh, or concerning their, um, the, 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 the fact they started selling the Naira, you know, exorbitantly. Think about this thing. So everything the people say no to is mm. what does not stand. We need more people on our side saying no to these exploitative practices, uh, practices that exploit people who are uneducated, people who are poor, you know, from accessing justice. We need a system in place to ask people, you know, after you've reported a case, um, for how long did it take before you even saw, uh, before, before you saw yourself in court? Mm. We need a system where people are able to tell us if they even know the name of their prosecutor when they get to court. Hmm. Because it's a common practice that many people whose cases are taken to court do not know the names of their police prosecutor. That's a very big problem. If they don't know the name of the prosecutor, is it the name of the the crime that is being charged on their behalf? That hmm. they many people don't know the crime that is being charged. They don't say, so the matter don't reach court. So they say, make I come this day. Hmm. So I don't get transport money. Now why I not come? How do we practically support indigent people to make it to court when they need to be in court? Oh, Who right. is explaining the legal processes to them hmm. so that they are taking the best possible decisions? All we right. Need to Thank you so much, Dorothy. To do this thing. Hmm. Thank you so much, Dorothy Njemanzi, founder of Dorothy Njemanzi Foundation. Thank you so much for masking the truth on corruption with me today. Thank you for having me on. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So, yes, you've heard from Dorothy of Dorothy in Jamazi Foundation. So, those of sexual abuse should be able to get justice regardless of economic status. Our judicial system must be sanitized of corrupt elements who stand in the way of justice. We're calling on the government and all stakeholders to look into our porous judicial system for justice to be served on perpetrators of violence against women. Our women must be protected at all costs. If you have a story on corruption in your community that you would like us to talk about, please share your comments by sending us a text or a WhatsApp message 070-317-56537. Unmasking the Truth on Effects of Corruption on Women from the Gender Lens is an initiative of St. Ives Communications in partnership with Voice of Women and supported by the MacArthur Foundation. Thanks to the producer Omozele Omoren and executive producer Tom Okewale Shonaya. My name is Esther Alaribi. WFM 91.7